I was completely out of gas and had only 20 sweat-drenched dollars in my pocket as I pulled into the University of Houston to pursue my MFA in directing. What an indignation it was to realize that scholarly life did not provide me with the income necessary for gas, rent, and utilities. I immediately solicited Dr. Dorff, my theater theory and criticism professor, to help with my need for work. And she immediately called her childhood friend Donna, a thin, crude, 55-year-old businesswoman and owner of the Garden Gate. The Garden Gate was an upscale nursery located in the heart of Houston's Rice Village. Now, given the choice, I would have chosen not to work. You see, I have this dream of getting paid handsomely to write and direct plays. <laughs> but the reality was, this job provided me with the income I needed. At the Garden Gate, I worked with five other guys, and I was the only gringo. Because of my color, I was given most of the menial jobs. I cleaned, <laughs> I cleaned the men's room, swept and dusted all the offices, had to clean, feed, and water Donna's beloved canaries, which are, by the way, the most slovenly creatures on the earth. <laughs> At the university, I was esteemed. I was at the top of my class. I was handpicked by Sir Peter Hall and Edward Albee to direct workshop pieces. Dr. Dorff used my papers as ex examples of exemplary work. And yet, at the garden gate, I felt mentally impotent. All Donna wanted from me was a shimmering porcelain throne for others to crap in. <laughs> I don't want the guys to think I'm treating you any differently, she would say. You're not. You're treating me worse. <laughs> and for the first time in my life, I felt the sting of being a minority. I wanted to quit, but between my father's Puritan work ethic that taught me quitting was a sin, and my need for money, I begrudgingly soldiered on. Because I wanted to uh, expose Donna's discrimination, and I felt I would be fired if I beleaguered her with complaints, I decided to quench my anger by finding a co-worker to harass. <laughs> After completing my menial daily tasks, most of my time was spent with Felipe. Felipe was the jefe of our six-member crew, and every morning we would recite our customary repartee. How you doing, Mark? It's Mag, Felipe. I uh, know, that's what I say. I say Mark. No, there, there's no R in it. It's Mac. I know, that's what I say. Mark. <laughs> okay, Felipe. He knows my name. He just didn't want to say it, I thought. And the bitterness burned in my gut. What better target could there be? And Felipe became the object of my misdirected antipathy. One afternoon, while on a fountain installation, my indignation climaxed, and I did not properly level the foundation. Within hours of returning to work, the office got a call from an irate customer complaining that her fountain had fallen over. I seized the moment and was able to blame the whole incident on Felipe, <laughs> because he wasn't fluent in English. After a few days, and after he realized what had happened, he inquired about my feelings towards him. Hey, Mark, you know like if I'm Mexicans? I, I forgot to mention, uh, Felipe is short and fat. <laughs> no, Felipe, I don't. So, you know like me? No, Felipe, I don't. <laughs> Felipe furrowed his brow, so they kind of looked like a pillow pet. <laughs> <laughs> then he turned and walked away. I thought he was going to complain to Donna, he didn't. He took the blame for it. When we went back to repair the damage, he stood there while the customer screamed in his face, and still, he said nothing. I was impressed and amazed by his ability to accept and forgive my mistreatment, and I was embarrassed by my behavior. As I watched him repair the damage, I thought, no wonder I chose him as the target of my anger. He is exactly the kind of man I want to be honest, hardworking, he doesn't get caught up in petty squabbles, and he's unselfish. However, as soon as that thought escaped my mind, my indignation returned, and a new thought entered. 
How can I use Felipe to quench my anger and make Donna aware of her discrimination if he doesn't respond? I decided to try a personal attack. Our company's Christmas party was coming up, and I thought he would make a good Santa Claus. Hey, Felipe, you want to play Santa? No, Mark. Why not? You'd be great. No, Mark. Why? I can't get the ho-ho. <laughs> And then he laughed with the other guys, and they had a boisterous time teasing Felipe about his belly that was as round as a bowl full of jelly. He was able to laugh at himself. And in that moment, as I watched these Hispanic guys laugh and tried to do the ho-ho, I thought, you're not hurting him. You're hurting yourself. And then my understanding deepened, and I was immediately slapped in the face with the realization that I was overcompensating for being treated like a Neanderthal at the garden gate by acting like an arrogant genius at school. I felt that anyone else's work was menial, and I told them so. I damaged a lot of relationships that way. Felipe's behavior reveal, revealed to me that intelligence is knowing that you don't know everything. So at work, I stopped trying to retaliate for my unfair treatment. I worked quietly, without trouble. And a few months later, as we lifted a heavy stone basin, Felipe fell to the ground, writhing in pain, and suddenly one of the guys was screaming at me to take Felipe to the hospital because I was the only one with a license and could speak English. At the hospital, it was discovered that Felipe had a hernia and a ruptured disc in his back. He would have to undergo surgery. As the news sunk in, the image of the irate customer screaming in the face of this proud man replayed in my mind like a nightmare. I knew I had to stay with him until his family arrived. Hopefully, the damage wasn't irre irre irrevocable. As we sat in the hospital room, we began to talk. Hey, Mark. It's Mac, Felipe. <laughs> I know, that's what I say. I say, Mark. Okay, Felipe. What do you need? I know Miss Donna, I mean to you. No, no, she's not. Yeah, I know she meant to you. That's why I help you. Let's not, let's not talk about that. It's all right. No, it's not all right. Usted es un buen amigo. How can you say that? I know you, Mark. He was aware of Donna's discrimination the whole time. And he tried to help. I was overcome by his loving heart and kindness and left the room before the tears began to flow. As Felipe went through his surgeries and during his two-week recovery, I visited him almost daily. I yearned to make amends with him, to be that good friend. I began to take his son to work so he wouldn't have to ride the bus. I got to know and appreciate his family. And when his son eventually got married, I was honored to be an usher. When Felipe returned to work, he and I went on many more fountain installations. The only difference was now I tried to learn from him, about him, and about the job. And when I would do something well, I reveled in his seal of approval. Now you cooking with gas, Mark. <laughs> Indeed I was. Because I even learned to let go of Donna's maltreatment. And when I finished grad school, I got a teaching job and it was time to leave the garden gate. On my last day, I, I reminisced about all I had learned from Felipe, the meaning of the golden rule, that action is the real measure of intelligence, and what a good work ethic looks like. And as the last few minutes of the day ticked away, I laughed because I was sad to be leaving. And as I walked out the door, Felipe came over and said, Hey, Mark. You know, like your fat Mexicans? <laughs> no, Felipe. I love them. 